Would you take your Bibles to the book of Acts with me? Acts chapter 6. It is a pleasure to have one of our minister families, AG past ministers in the audience with us this morning. Just wave at it. They are uh, coming through the area and just in, and are visiting with us and engaging with us this morning. We welcome you guys. God bless y'all for being with us this morning. Let's stand for the reading of the word, Acts chapter 6. Now, you're going to recognize why some of this is taking place this morning when we get to one of the parts because there's opposition. There's demonic intent to destroy what God has established. How many know what it means to be under pressure? And um, we've all faced it and we'll all face it again. But when you're under pressure, it's just opportunity for God to just show himself in a very powerful way. I, uh, I, I, have, I have personally seen the, the miracle of God this year. I, I have seen, uh, and I was prepared whatever God way you wanted to do it, but uh, I, we are all recipients of the grace and the mercy of God. I, I've gotten to the book of Acts chapter 6 and 7. Some say, well, I thought we preached on 6 last week. Part of it we did. So we're, get, we're, we're moving steadily along at a snail's pace, and uh, that's okay. God's got some great stuff for us, and I, I hope you're getting it. We do welcome those of, that are watching this morning uh, or will be watching uh, by way of, of um, live streaming today, and uh, we welcome you guys, and I pray God will touch you. He's, he, if you have a need this morning, God's got you right where he wants you. He's going to touch you. Just call upon him. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just call on the name of the Lord. And uh, some of you guys that are watching even now, you've been searching. You've been wanting something to change in your life. Get ready. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to relate a story about Stephen. We mentioned his name last week in uh, talking about um, the calling and the giftings that God places in the church. And I, I, I want to say thank you to those. You know, I, I have not given specifics yet about, I mean, we, we had an altar full of people last week that were opening their hearts up, God, whatever you want to use me in. You know, I, I believe God uses busy people, people that are committed, people that won't say, I don't know where to get in at. Just get in. If it's to come and pick up trash, if it's to come and clean toilets, well, well, we, well, that, well, we got that taken care of. And uh, but uh, I'm sure Charlotte or Charles wouldn't mind that a bit either. And so, uh, but I, I don't care what it is. Just you know, or you got a ministry God is burdening your heart with. Come talk to me. Come tell me. Um, I, I want to empower you. I want to set you free to go minister. And uh, God's got more folks. God's got more things He wants to do in and through us than we could ever imagine. And so get ready. But we talked about Stephen and talked about the seven that were chosen, They're the word uh, diakonos, servants, and uh, uh, they became servants of the Lord. One of those, not that he was more special than anyone else, why did he have to die? Well, God had a plan for his life. Look with me in chapter 6, verse 8. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. And opposition arose. Isn't that just like the devil? <laughs> Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, uh, who began to argue with Stephen. I love verse 10. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Isn't that awesome? You're going to get uh, backfire. But this world cannot stand up against the wisdom of God. Verse 11, so when Satan can't come in one way, he's going to do another way. Verse 11 says, then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And so they stirred or they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. And they produced false witnesses who testified, and this is what they said, this fellow never stopped speaking about the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that, Jesus, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses had handed down to us. And so all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. Now, I want you to catch this. Notice this last phrase. With all this stuff going on, I don't know how you and I would respond. We want to say how we would, but until we've been put in that spot, 
the worry or the anxiety. Maybe here's what are we going to do? I want you to notice what they saw on Stephen's face. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. God, give us that grace that when we're under pressure, we have the face of an angel. Father, thank you. Father, thank you for the word that's already gone forth in worship and word that's gone forth as we pray and believe for the miracles of God that are going to take place, have already taken place. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I ask right now, God, I ask that you'd breathe upon me. I ask that you breathe through my soul right now to be able to share this word. I know this is for today. It's a different kind of word, God. I, I ask that you would just, even through the pressure of things, even through the uh, reality of things that will come in days ahead, God, give us grace and mercy to stand when we've done all else to stand, stand with the armor of God all around us. Thank you for the results. It's in your hands. God, I'm going to do what you called me to do. And God, I leave the rest to you. God, cleanse my mind, my thoughts, my heart, my sins, everything. Let the, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying right now to the church. In Jesus' name, the strong Son of the living God, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. The next chapter and a half and even to the first part of chapter 8 is dealing, and, it, and not that this was the only time that we see persecution, but the next, um, the ending verses of chapter 6 and chapter 7, even into verse 1 of chapter 8, it deals with the, deals with the, the uh, stoning of Stephen, it deals with the, uh, the people, it deals with with Stephen declaring how he stood and what he stood on. But it also, chapter 8, it deals with a new man on the scene by the name of Saul. And we're going to talk about that as we, as we come to that this morning. It's an amazing statement. The Spirit empowered Stephen to do ministry. You go back to chapter 6 when the, the apostles were saying, you know, look for those that are filled with the Spirit of God and filled with faith. Those are the ones you're going to choose from. Stephen was one. We don't know a whole lot about the others, but Stephen and Philip, they seem to be uh, two of the key uh, characters on the list of God. Not that they were more important than these others because they were all filled with the Spirit of God. But we only see, as far as the narrative, that God, uh, we see what these two individuals did. We'll catch Philip a little bit later. But Stephen here, such a gracious man of God. Now, I, I did, I, I, only way I know him is by what God has said about him. I mean, scriptures describe the narrative and uh, what he went through. And one of the most powerful things here is, and, and that you see that really describes, and that that would be enough to us, that first statement, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. How many kind of know what Stephen's about now? a man full of grace and the power of God. You see, when Stephen spoke up about Jesus, some people from the part of the Roman Empire began arguing with him. And their problem was that he won the arguments and they got really ticked off. They didn't want to lose. And so in their rage, they plotted against him. And they, and they also convinced others to, to say that Stephen had spoken blasphemies or cursed Moses and God. And, and so the crowds even now turned against him and the, the religious leaders arrested him. And I'm, I'm going to kind of give you a, a macro zoom and then we're going to macro come in into the specific areas. And the crowds turned against him. The leaders arrested him, brought him in front of the Sanhedrin. And this was the same group that Jesus... Peter and John had faced before this council, the Sanhedrin. Then these false witnesses, they spoke up, and, 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 and Stephen offered his defense, and it was a detailed story, the faith. I mean, it was beautiful, I, and I hope you're reading this. I hope, I hope you're reading ahead of me, and, and, and they'll go back and read it again, but 6 and 7, it's, a, it's an incredible story of the faith from Abraham to Jesus. He wasn't telling them a new story. Uh, he, they had... Uh, they had heard and studied of the Jewish nation all their lives, but they refused to connect the Old Testament with the redemptive story and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All they had, all they wanted to know about was the old, and they had rejected Jesus. 
And these false witnesses spoke, and and Stephen offered his defense uh, of that story, and Stephen patiently and persistently narrated the story of God. Let me tell you, God's got a good story, doesn't he? I mean, look at it. I mean, look what God has done. So patiently and persistently, he preached this this message to, to, with his desire to rescue people from their sins. But when he saw that the religious leaders were rejecting Jesus, he then spoke the plain hard truth. Remember, Scripture says Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. See, truth is just as strong as grace. We, we, we live in grace. But I understand you've got to speak hard truths at times. And as Jesus did, as a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, Stephen knew what was coming. He said, you stiff-necked people. Huh, that's pretty strong. You ever call anybody stiff-necked? That may not be the right thing to say at times, you know? He said, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are, all, are still, still uncircumcised. You, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He said, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? This is verse 52 of chapter 7. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but you've not obeyed it. You can imagine Stephen knew what was coming next. The crowd was just growing in demonic anticipation. They were bloodthirsty. That word witness, it means martyr or the willingness to die for a cause. You know, it was Paul even himself who said, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It was Paul who also said, I, he said, for me to live is but to You see, these men, during this whole process, as even they began to stone Stephen, and one after the other, nothing could shake the faith of Stephen. What a powerful story. And the men who threw these rocks, they took off their tunics and gave them to someone to look after while they committed their atrocities against God's choice servant. You know who the man was? It was Saul, who later became Paul. You see, guys, one of the things about I want you to understand that even in the midst of being under pressure, God can give you confidence to face whatever comes because of your stand for Jesus Christ. I don't care what you're going through today. God's got confidence to go under, go with the pressure that you're going through. No matter what it is, I've got confidence. I love the old, the old song, God's going to see me through. No matter what the case may be, I know he's going to fix it for me. I think it was Andre Crouch who wrote that song. I've got confidence. How many has got confidence in the Lord? Amen. Confidence that he's able. No, I don't have confidence in myself. I've got confidence in the Lord. Well, let me, let me kind of unpack a, a story to you this morning. First thought is this. Stephen, because this is where it all begins, Stephen was a man that was full of grace and power. Anybody here want to be full of grace and power? It says first he was full of grace and full of God's power. And then it says he did great wonders and miraculous signs. If he was not under grace and filled with grace, there would have been no miraculous signs. Something about this stood out this past Friday in our staff uh, prayer time. I mean, the presence of God just fell in, that, in, in our outer office. And I, I, I had just been reading, I just had seen that. And it says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. God, I want to be full of grace. That word grace, remember, do you understand? How many understands that you're controlled by whatever fills you? As a man thanketh, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. If you're filled with jealousy, the success of others will infuriate you. If you're filled with lust, your sexual appetites will lead you into great darkness. If you're, if you're filled with anger, you'll quarrel and even murder your, with your thoughts. But if you're filled with God's power and wisdom, you'll live a life like Stephen demonstrated and others oriented Christ exalting life. Because a life that is filled with grace and the power of God is not about themselves. It's even when the pressure comes that you find out what's in somebody. How many's found out some things in you under pressure that you thought, hmm, didn't know that was there? <laughs> There's things in us that, that we maybe. Bury and, and that, but that comes out 
understanding. We're controlled by what we're filled with. If you're full of grace and full of the power of God, guess what's going to come out when problems hit and pressure hits? Because pressures have a way of causing us to let some steam off. I don't know how y'all cook collards. Say, how'd you get from that to collards? Well, not hard. I love them. My mom taught me how to cook collards with pressure cooker. I may have lost some of y'all on that. Mine doesn't take long, but they taste just as good as yours or better. Okay, that was a big statement, wasn't it? No. I ain't telling you what I put in it because it ain't good for me and I don't care. And, uh, but, you know, using a pressure cooker, it's, it's kind of a little bit uh, uh, anxious and having that thing and that thing go, and it's letting off that pressure, that steam. And if I got it on too high, I'd go, mom says, don't do that. You got to turn the heat down just a little bit. So, you know, have I got you with me this morning? Okay. This was not in my notes. It just, it's, it, we'll place it under the anointing, okay? <laughs> but, uh, I, well, maybe not. I don't know. But I, that little thing, it rises and lets me know that that cylinder, that pot has got this pressure pressing down and cooking this stuff, and it's being changed. And when it comes out, it's totally different than when it went in there. Now, I'm not stupid enough to just go and take it off the thing and just open up the lid. This is not good. Mom told me, you've got to run cold water. Now, I've got an old one. My pressure cooker is probably, I don't have the latest, greatest thing. You just press a button and it does it, and I don't, I don't have that thing. I got this old thing that, you, you, how many know what I'm talking about? The one I got, yeah, yeah, that's the old one. And so that's what I got. And uh, it's probably, well, we've been married 35 years. It's probably 35 years old. And, uh, and so you have to run cold water underneath it and hold it there until the, the thing pops down. Then it'll let you know you can open it up and release the pressure. When you open that thing up, Jesus comes down. I'm, I kid you not. It is, it is absolutely, I, 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 it's, a, it's a moment with Jesus. I'm telling you, it is, it is, he provided the food. He provided it. And so uh, I, yeah, Cheryl, she'll tell you that. And uh, I, I'm, I'm picky. I'm picky. I know y'all don't know that, but I'm picky about what my collars taste like. And so uh, I, don't want, I just won't eat everybody's at the, at the restaurants. I say, does, now you're going you're gonna to go off on me on this because some of you say, well, you can't cook about that. Yes, you can. Talk to me. And uh, I, don't have, I don't have onions in mine. I don't like onions in my collars. So anyway, that has nothing to do with what I'm preaching. Here's what it is. I'm just wanting some collards right now. That's, that's, here's, here's, what, here's what it is. There is a change that takes place because of the pressure that is put onto those greens. And they come out edible. They come out smelling like incredible and tasting. Well, maybe the smell, it does smell the house up, but that's another story. But the taste is absolutely unbelievable. Never would have been that way unless it had experienced the pressure. Some way, somehow, step beyond my collared story and step into the reality when God allows pressure placed on your life. You can come forth a couple of different ways, but if you let God bring you forth like gold, he will challenge you. He will allow things, see all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. And the steam of it is pressing. It's changing. We don't like it, but it hurts sometimes. The steam, the, the pressure, the heaviness, the, the pain of the pressure, whether it be sickness or whether it be, be family issues or job-related things or financial-related things or church-related things or whatever, pressure is pressure, and it can hit, and we can either get stressed out, we can get uh, anxious, and, or we can result in, in, in a, a hatefulness, and we, we just respond negatively back, or we, we, uh, we crash out, or we, 
we lash out at God and say, God, why? Why am I going through this? But God says all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I don't know what pressure you're facing today, but if you'll just stay under pressure, God's hand, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. Now, I want to I wanna bring you into uh, another part. I'm not going to fall off. You're worried about me falling off. My wife hates it when I'm about this. But I, 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 uh, I want to bring you into something. Sometimes the results of pressure is not always what we want. Now, be prepared for this this morning because I'm going to get to that here in just a few minutes. I don't know what time it is, but y'all okay. Be prepared and understand that sometimes the pressure will cause things that will bring honor and glory to him and not necessarily to you. Because wouldn't you agree it's all about him? It's not about us. That he may increase and that we may decrease. I want you to look at the narrative a little bit closer. Let's get a little bit closer in now. The Bible says, number one, that Stephen was full of grace. That word grace is the word charis. It means graciousness or or of manner or act. It means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. It's acceptable or it's a benefit. There's another word that is descriptive of grace, favor. You could say he was full of favor and power. Wow. Anybody here full of the favor of God? Amen. Amen. I have the favor of God. How about you? I have the favor of God. I have the favor of God. I have the favor of God. You know, I, I uh, don't know how many know this. We, I, I've not even announced this yet. Um, you know, we had this house down the road. You know, God, God spoke to our hearts. We felt and we, God, we sold this house and the land next to it. God blessed us there. We've had this other house uh, two doors down. Uh, we bought it at a particular time, felt it was God to, to do so. And uh, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do with it. We're not trying to be in the real estate business or anything. And so after we repaired it uh, and, and we've, we, we rented it out a couple of years, we used also to be able to renovate. Uh, we had some structural issues in the gym and some things. We got some things done. And so as most of you know that are members, we, uh, last year we put it on the market with your uh, approval. And do you know that thing has sold and now the money's in the bank? Now, I want, I want to remind, just tell you something. You don't understand this. Um, and there's a reason I'm, 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 I'm bringing this up because it's something our realtor said. Um, do you understand that because of that house, well, let me, let me step back out of that, because of God, we were basically able to do all the renovation during this time debt-free because of what we got on the sale of the house. That's God. Now, now, now let me give you, as the, uh, they used to say, the rest of the story. The rest of the story is this. A lady by the name of Deborah Walters with Carolina One Real Estate. She's connected, goes to Faith Assembly of God, and Cheryl said, we need to use her. We called her up, and one of the things that she said, God's favor is on me. I mean, she didn't mind saying that a bit. And I'm telling you, it was a miracle. I mean, our house sold just, I mean, it was amazing. It was just God. It was God. Let me tell you, not only is it on Deborah Walters, and and I'll show you and tell her I said that, but I'm telling you, God's favor rests on each of you. You are under the favor of God. Now, some of y'all didn't really receive that. Some of you say, well, then why am I going through what I'm going through? You're still, just because you're not, just because you're under pressure does not mean you're not in the favor of God. God has favored you in everything that he does. He favors you. It's the year of the Lord's favor. You have the favor of God in your finances. You have the favor of God in your job. You have the favor of God in this church. You have the favor of God in your community. Say, how do I know that? Are you still alive? Is God good? Are you eating food? Are you driving a car? Are you living in a house or an apartment or somewhere? You've got the favor of God on you. I 
have good health. I have an incredible family. I have the favor of God on me. I have incredible kids and grandkids, and and I I have the favor of God on me. I was raised in an incredible uh, uh, atmosphere. I'm a third-generation AG pastor. I have the favor of God on me, not just because I'm a pastor, but we each have the favor of God on us. So he was full of grace or favor, and he was full of power. See, understand One of the seven that was selected from the people to be a servant leader, he was full of faith in the Holy Spirit, but he was also full of grace and power. He was the recipient and the channel of God's unmerited favor. And Luke introduced this man by the name of Stephen, and it was a man in Christ in whom Christ lived. He had experienced the grace of the atonement, and the grace of the Lord had produced an identifiable grace upon him. Here's where I'm trying to get to this morning. How many could declare this morning, I am full of the grace of God? Okay, let me say, how many want to be full of the grace of God? How many not going to do anything this morning? Full of grace. The Bible says, okay, let me me put it this way. How many are saved in this house? How many have no Jesus? They know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If somebody ain't listening to him beside you, say, what's wrong with you? And uh, no, don't don't, don't do that. Don't, Don't do that. So if you're saved, that means you're full of grace. Okay, now go with me. Track with me this morning. If you're full of grace, then that totally changes your persona. That changes your facial attributes. That changes how you respond to pressure. That changes how you talk to people, what you say and what you don't say. That changes how you drive. That mm. Did I go too far? That changes how you talk to your children. Thank God for the grace, amen. (laughs) That changes how you talk to your husband. Don't make me, I'll come down and preach at y'all, right there, down there. That changes how you talk to your wife. That changes what you do. That changes how you look. It just changes you. It makes you look a 10 instead of a zero. On a scale of one to 10, do you feel like a five or do you feel like a two? Or do you feel like a 10? I hope somebody can say, I feel like a 10 this morning because I'm a child of God this morning. Amen? You know there's some in the house that way. Come on now. (laughs) Come on. How many don't even have a scale? You feel that good. You feel blessed of God. Holy, accept them to God. Come on. God is good all the time. Come on. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God is good. We are full of the grace of God. What you see in the mirror does not have to describe what's in your heart. You may think, oh, I can't get my hair right. I can't get the clothes right. But I'm telling you, if you got it right with Jesus, you all right because you are full of the favor of God. In other words, the grace of the Lord produced a grace in Stephen. He was a person that radiated grace. An impelling and an infectious graciousness was about him and surrounded him and even came out in his witness. Even when he was under pressure, they looked over at him and they said, his face looks like an angel. That's grace, guys. When you're full of grace... You find out and you learn how to treat people with grace. Being full of grace doesn't mean we just get to see amazing grace, how sweet the sound. When you're full of amazing grace, it changes how you act on this earth. It changes how you deal with people. Because God says, if you say, I love God, but I hate your brother, you don't need, you're lying. When you're full of the grace of God, Colossians 4, 6. Can, can I ask this morning, how many's blown it in what you said? How many has blown it in what you have said or how you have said it? Oh, y'all were just going to let me be on my own? Is that what it was? Yeah. You didn't hear me. I, I'll take that. Okay. 
You didn't comprehend it. Okay, I got you. And it's a good day. It is good. I found out you can't get your words back. I found out you can't take them back because once you say it, it's there. Folks, I've said some things. I have, I have responded in ways. I have shouted. I have been mean and ugly. I know y'all look at me and say, no, not our pastor. He hasn't done that. He, we know our pastor. We, he don't talk that way. There are times only by, <laughs> only by the grace of God am I what I am today. Only by the grace of God. And understand that grace, it covers a multitude of sins. Only I, I want to make you think this morning. I know this is kind of different than what I've preached last week, and all, I, but this is just kind of where God's got it at this morning. By the grace of God. Understand, grace is just more than what we preach about. Grace is what we experience on a daily basis. See, the Bible says it this way, that be gracious. Colossians 4, 6 says, this is not up on the screen, but, but maybe mark it down. Colossians 4, 6 says, be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation, not put them down and not cut them out. Husbands and wives, when you talk to each other, how do you talk? How do we talk to our kids? I've been guilty of not doing well at all. How do we talk to each other? Do we, do we let people have a piece of our mind because, well, they deserved it? No, they deserve grace. No, they don't. They did, did this to me. No. Well, what have you done? That doesn't mean you can't correct situations, but we do it in the grace of God. Grace changes how we see people. Grace causes this church to reach out to 69 families yesterday in the food bank. Grace causes our ladies that, that go uh, every week and work. You ought to see the pile of clothes we have up in, in the food bank. I'm telling you, Betty, it, 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 it's, oh, no, she's not here today. That's right. She's, uh, she's out ministering today. Uh, all those, how many work in a food bank and clothing bank? Can I see your hand? Isn't, isn't it amazing? I mean, it, it is clothes and clothes. People, just, people are now bringing us clothes, have been for a while, because they know that we have a connection with, the, with people of, the, of, this, of this community, that we give it out. And the grace that they, they operate in, it's absolutely amazing. Ephesians 1, 6, and 7 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2, 8 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And then here's how God tells us what to do with the grace. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And this would be attainable to all of us. This next scripture, 2 Peter three eighteen says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me take you on a little experiment here. Everybody got your Bible? How many's got the printed copy? Can I see him? This is not against those of you that have the uh, iPad or the iPhones or the, the computer Bible. It's just that I can turn quicker than you can probably go there right now, and that's okay. But I, I, I want to show you. I, I just want to real quickly go to the book of Romans, chapter 1. I just want to show you what Paul thought about the grace of God. Romans 1 verse 5 says, Through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. Here it is, verse 7. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Go down to the end of Romans uh, chapter number 16. It says here, verse number 20, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. 
Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, number 12. Excuse me, not chapter 12, chapter number 16. It says, verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Are you getting this? Are you understanding this? There's something that Paul had to do, had to say. Verse number 2 of chapter 2 of Corinthians, he said, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of 2 Corinthians, verse Verse 14, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Verse number three of Galatians, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. End of Galatians chapter number six, he says, verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus. There's something to the grace of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Ephesians 1, verse 2, grace and peace to you. I understand this was greetings, but this is what Paul had in him. Grace be to you. End of Ephesians, he says, peace to the brothers and, 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 with, and, and love and with faith from the Lord, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love. Go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God. End of Philippians, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Colossians, grace, peace to you from God. You get my drift. There was something and still something about the grace of God. Paul was saying, I bless you with grace. I bless you with grace. Grace be with you. Grace. Grace. Folks, we need the grace of God. Wow. We need the grace and the mercy of God in our lives like we've never needed it before. It seems like pressures abound. I can't get through with this. I've got 10 more pages to go. Y'all hang on. <laughs> it seems like more than ever before, we need the grace of God. There's an old song, an old hymn we used to sing, grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse from sin. Is that right? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will then all our sin. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Hallelujah. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious is that grace. The hour, the hour I first believed through many dangerous toils and snares I have. Come, tis grace, tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me morning. 
believe there's an anointing of grace in this room this morning. You know, I... I'm up here thinking about that, that crock, that uh, pot again. Pressure cooker. Mm. <laughs> More ways than one. I can't tell you for sure that the pressure is going to ever be let off. can't tell you most likely well I'm not going to tell you the pressure is going to be let off there are days that we have breathers and I know the scripture talks about God not putting more on us than we can handle I mean, but you know to some degree understand we can't handle any of it without the grace of God we can't handle any of it Stephen, a man full of grace. I was in a restaurant the other night downtown and one I hadn't been to, one that's very comparatively to a lot of the place down there very inexpensive and I've got a hamburger and and uh, honestly we were using a car that we got blessed with to go with me and Christopher and Cheryl I can't tell you I sinned what I did now you're already judging me I know it I'm not always blessed with patience. Y'all just gonna let me be up here by myself, huh? Yeah. And uh, and for some reason, it was taking longer than I wanted. You ever been there? And, uh, oh, now you're laughing. Yeah, now, yeah. And so, uh, the waitress was coming back and she was not going to stop at my table. And I, gracefully maybe, I was nice. I just asked, is the food coming? Is it? She said, yeah, there's that. I mean, she was really nice. She, she, she was nice. And I think I embarrassed my son and my wife. And uh, see, now y'all tell, now y'all looking at me. You know, and, and I don't always do that. But uh, that's a little simple thing. There's a lot of things that I've lost. I won't even tell y'all. that I didn't have grace. Are you full of grace? When you're dealing with people, are you full of grace? Because I'm telling you, God lavishly made us rich with the grace of God. Nothing I could deserve but he just poured it on me where sin did abound. God, how can you cover all this? He said, I got this. God, I don't want to get, stop. I got this. And he just poured his blood over me. Grace. Grace. For by grace am I saved. How are you going to show grace tomorrow? How are you going to deal with grace today? Freely you have received. Freely what? Give. 
I'm not going to ask you to lift your hands to show me how many people have not shown grace like I have before. But most likely 100% of us could say, yeah, I've messed that up. God, I say, fill me with grace. Fill us with grace. Help us to grow in grace. Help me to grow in grace. God, I don't know what the pressures that may come and that have already affected me, how it may touch somebody else's life. So God, fill me with grace that I can have opportunity to speak the grace of God, to demonstrate the grace of God, to share about the grace of God. I need grace. I need daily grace. I need daily favor. I need help daily. How about you? If that's you, folks, I believe the altar. I believe things are settled in this altar here. If if you've been a recipient of grace, but you say, no, I hadn't run out of grace, I'm just not using the grace. I need more grace than than you're talking my language. I need more grace. I need the grace daily to accomplish the task. Stephen, he was a man full of grace. To the point that when they were throwing the rocks and killing him, he looked up and he saw Jesus. I had I got to share on this. He looked up and saw as the heavens had opened up, he saw him and he said, Lord, don't lay this charge to them. That's grace. That's grace. People that need grace, would you step out?